How's it going, Yankee fans? Welcome back to Fireside Yankees with your boys, Alex and Ryan. So the pitching market has been slow, but rumors are heating up. Yesterday and last night, Ken Rosenthal of The Athletic reported that the Yankees are interested in inquiring about Chicago White Sox starting pitcher, if not ace, Dylan Cease. Now, Dylan Cease is their most valuable trade asset. Uh, they're not necessarily looking for starting pitching talent. And look, the truth is the Yankees don't have much of it after they gave away seven pitchers to acquire Soto, Verdugo, and Grisham. So now you ask yourself, what are we willing to give up for Dylan Cease? Because we talked about this mock trade yesterday that we were like, no way. It Maybe it would have been fair, but we just don't agree with it. Now the reports are coming out today that they actually are interested in Dylan Cease. We're going to talk about him, and we're going to talk about really ranking the top guys the Yankees should be interested in, the guys that really um, make the most sense, aren't going to cost you an arm and a leg. You're not going to give away top prospects for um, either money or acquiring guys that would cost a little bit less on the trade market. So, Ryan, before we dive into Dylan Cease and kind of ranking what makes the most sense for this team right now, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great. You know, as you mentioned, the Yankees' interest in Dylan Cease is, I mean, it seems to be legit, right? Not to the point where, you know, I would sit here and say, hey, the Yankees are going to trade for Dylan Cease. I've kind of, I, I would kind of parallel it more to what the Blue Jays were with Juan Soto, which was they were interested and they did make an offer, but it didn't really go anywhere. Um, I think the Orioles are going to end up with Dylan Cease. That's just, that's just my read on it. Like they have the best package to offer, um, but the Yankees might be able to swoop in and, and get that deal done. You know, one could argue that back when we were interested in Matt Olson, that we had a better offer than anything the Braves could offer. And they swooped in and got him. For Sean Murphy, like the Rays were involved. The Guardians were involved. They had more to offer. And the Braves swooped in and got him. So perhaps that's something that happens here where like the White Sox just like what the Yankees have more. But, you know, I'm going to just say for Yankee fans, don't bank on Dylan Cease coming to the Bronx. But what I would say is that this indicates the Yankees want a frontline starter. And Andy Martino mentioned this. The Yankees are going to have an active month of January, apparently. Um, he mentioned earlier today that the Yankees, I uh, tweeted it out, that the Yankees want an impact starter. They want a frontline guy. And they have every reason to want one, right? Looking at the rotation, their current fifth starter is Clayton Beater, uh, at least according to Fangraphs. I think if they were going to have an actual fifth starter competition, that Will Warren would win that job, or that Chase Hampton could compete for that job. And I think those two guys would emerge over Clayton Beater. Uh, but ultimately, Alex, like these are not the options we should be talking about when it comes to the New York Yankees are trying to win the 2024 World Series. Am I saying that they don't have prospects in their system that could be league average starters? No, they definitely do. Um, but you know, they should definitely do their due diligence, and they need to go out at least find some form of impact pitching. Maybe it's in the bullpen, maybe it's in the rotation, whatever it may be. Uh, but it looks like they're not keen on running you know, uh, a, a prospect battle for the fifth starter job. Um, perhaps if they had a guy, um, you know, a little more, perhaps, they, perhaps if they had a little more security in the top of the rotation, like if Carl Sordon had a big year last year, or Nesta Cortez was good last year, I think they would be more comfortable going to a Will Warren or Chase Hampton, but, you know, we saw the ugly side of Carl Sordon's injury issues. It's not just that he doesn't pitch a lot, um, it's the fact that if, you, if you're not pitching a lot and you're constantly injured, you can lose your feel for your pitches, and you lose command, and once you lose command and feel, you're sporadic, and he's a two-pitch pitcher anyway, so, you know, that third time through the order penalty is pretty insane for those type of pitchers it, it gets pretty rough like you have to be on your game at all times to, to be a two-pitch pitcher in this league and Rodon has shown the ability to do it but you know I, I just think that the Yankees want more security in their rotation do I think Dylan Cease is the type of guy you trade Spencer Jones for um not necessarily I don't I don't view him as you know that top of the line like number one type guy you know we were kind of talking a little bit before the podcast began we were talking you know about Corbin Burns and like I was fantasizing a little bit about Zach Wheeler which that's a conversation for Fireside Yankees 2025 that's not a 2024 conversation conversation but you know a guy like Corbin Burns you say all right this guy you put him right next to Garrett Cole and they're going to be the best you know these two are going to be the two best pitchers in the American League they're going to fight for a Cy Young all that stuff there are concerns about how Dylan Cease uh adjusted to the pitch clock he started throwing a little he didn't throw as hard as he did last year lost a little bit of his vertical ride as a result his stuff just wasn't as good he took a massive hit in stuff plus we're going to talk about another trade target later that you know people perceive as a guy who you know took a big hit to his stuff over the last year but Cease is a guy who did take a big hit to his stuff and I'm a little bit concerned as to how it's going to look going forward I know that the Yankees could probably get more out of Cease than the White Sox could um but again like are you are you trading you know a guy who it's Spencer Jones or Jason Dominguez as your number one prospect and it's not just those two you're going to be trading them and then you're trading Chase Hampton and then you're trading a guy like Henry Lillane and then you're maybe trading a fourth piece and you got two years of Cease which that's intriguing you get two whole years and that's great um, but he's a Boris Klein. He's going to get paid and he's not going to do it during his arbitration years. He will be doing it in free agency. So, you know, ultimately, Alex, I, I would say the Yankees' chance of getting Dylan Cease, definitely below 50%, 100%. I I'd probably go more like in the 15 to 20% range. And I think that might be a little generous. 
I don't see them getting Dylan Cease, but I think their interest in him at least indicates a motivation to go out and get a top guy. Clearly, we know what the Yankees need, and it is starting pitching. So the question now is how much and what are they willing to give up? Um, ranking, you know, my my prefer this is my preference. My preference being, you know, ranking the guys and most likely to come to the Yankees or be acquired. So right off the bat, I'm going to start, you know, Shane Bieber's the guy I think is the most likely to come to the Yankees for obvious reasons. He's costing you an estimated $12.2 million in arbitration. He's got, going to cost you a whole lot in terms of prospects, you know, maybe Everson Pereira plus a, a guy we probably have never heard of um, or a guy that, you know, a lot of you guys have never heard of. So I'm willing to do that mainly because Everson Pereira is completely blocked now. You got Soto, Grisham, Verdugo, Judge, Stanton, Dominguez, Spencer Jones. There's no way he's getting a chance on this roster, guys, unfortunately. Um, I just don't see a path for him unless he takes some significant step forward that we just don't see coming. I don't know how he gets regular innings here. Uh, so with that being said, you leverage that value now. He's a good player, 22 years old, good defender, a lot of offensive upside. Leverage it now for a guy like Bieber. The upside is obviously there. You guys know he's a former Cy Young award-winning pitcher. Pitched 200 innings in 2022. This is a good arm. You know, he's off. He's coming off a little bit of a down year. Velocity dropped a bit. But he's been working, I think, at, uh, at you know, he's been working somewhere. It was driveline? Yeah. Driveline. So he's working at driveline. So, you know, obviously a lot of players go there to try to bolster their, um, you know, bolster their stuff. And hopefully he can have a bounce back season. The Yankees are hoping for a couple of those. But he seems like the most likely based on the cost of what it actually will acquire, require to get him. The next on the list is Jordan Montgomery. Now, we know the Texas Rangers want him. But the reason I'm listing Montgomery over a lot of other guys is because it's only going to cost you money. And he's coming off a, po a, a season where he had, what, a 3-2 ERA, pitched a lot of innings, and... He dominated during the playoffs. Like, he proved that he can pitch during the postseason and in a World Series, let alone just, you know, uh, the pennant or whatever it might be the Yankees can't get past. Um, so, you know, looking at what the Yankees actually need right now, Montgomery has proven he can do exactly what they need, pitch in the playoffs, and obviously eat up a lot of innings. And he's a good lefty arm. So I'm, I'm, I'm putting him there because he's just going to cost money. He's not going to cost any draft cap or rather um, any prospect capital. And then number three, um, I have Blake Snell. Again, only going to cost money. Short-term deal would be preferable here, but I'm really listing like the easiest to acquire right now because the Yankees seemingly – um, I don't think that they're, they're trying to part ways with Jason Dominguez or Spencer Jones personally. After that, I think Dylan Cease is four. That's going to cost a lot. However, the upside is there. He's durable. He's a very good arm. You know, he, his velocity dipped a little bit last year, but if that recovers, you're looking at a guy that could run back another Cy Young caliber season. So having him, really, really great. I think they like that upside, but it's going to cost a lot. So, you know, now we're getting into the, the bottom tier of, of guys that are going to be a lot more difficult to acquire. Then I have Jesus Lazardo at five, who left the arm, really good stuff, some injury history in the past. I don't think it's very likely. And then number six, and which is going to be a bummer for a lot of you guys, Corbin Burns. I don't think this is possible. Um, Corbin Burns is in a rental year. The dude's elite. Like, if you're going, if you're one piece away from a championship, that's where you look. But I don't think the Yankees are one piece away. I think they're multiple starting pitchers away um, and a lot of bounce backs away. You know what I mean? Like, Rodon could mess this entire equation up for us. So, like, you look at what we really need. It's not just Corbin Burns. It's multiple players. And I think that going out and getting Corbin Burns on a one-year rental and giving up multiple premium prospects in return, we just did it for Juan Soto. You have to be dead set on extending him. Preferably, I'd rather wait until the trade deadline to make a tr try to make a push for a guy like this. He's going to cost you a hell of a lot less. And if you don't need him or he's hurt by then, you know, you, you have a little bit of insurance there. So I feel like we should wait on that one, see how it progresses. A lot of these moves, by the way, the Yankees don't necessarily need to be making them right now. Uh, Ryan, for for example, Dylan Cease, they can they may just be putting feelers out and then waiting until the deadline. You know what I mean? Like another team could look to you know the Baltimore Orioles have a really great farm system. They're interested. They're not paying players. They may leverage some of their minor league prospects to get a really good player like a Dylan Cease and make a run at a World Series with their young talent right now. But if if Chicago holds on to Cease for half a year. Now you get to see what he's doing, his consistency. You know, that that price tag probably comes down slightly, if not comes down for multiple other players like Lozardo, like um, Corbin Burns. I think that's actually my preference. I'd rather take the flyer, the gamble now on Shane Bieber, 
you know, it's not going to cost you a whole lot. And then wait until the deadline to make to try to make that next acquisition. You know, the price comes down. It's going to cost a lot less. And you have insurance that they're healthy when the time comes. That's my preference. Unless you're going to go free agency in that, in that in that case, you're overspending no matter what. And Cashman knows this. He's going to have to pay top dollar for Montgomery. He's going to have to pay top dollar for Snell. And the truth is, Burns is going to be a free agent next year. And Wheeler too. You, we were just talking about Zach Wheeler. You know, you 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 run the risk of not being in those markets, not being in the game for those those pitchers. And I think that's something I'm not willing to gamble. I, I'd rather wait for them, extend Soto, make a big play on one of those pitchers, than go and overpay right now for Montgomery or Snell. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So personally, Alex, um, you know, I think that the New York Yankees should look at this from the perspective of just because they had three hundred million dollars to spend on Yoshinobu Yamamoto doesn't mean that that money should go to another pitcher. If they can find a pitcher at the value they're looking for, um, and they think that that player is worth whatever dollar, I guess, whatever dollar amount they're looking for. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't know if the, like, I just don't know if the Yankees are in a position where, like, is Jordan Montgomery at six years, and, and apparently according to Joel Sherman, um, and, and again, this is what he's asking for. This, is, this, doesn't, this does not mean it's what he's going to get. It's just what he's asking for. Jordan Montgomery's representatives have told teams he's looking to top the $172 million given Aaron Nola. And I'm going to be honest with you, Alex, I am not interested in paying Jordan Montgomery over $172 million. And, you know, I'm fine about the fact that, you know, I'm fine about the fact with the fact that Jordan Montgomery can sign elsewhere. And I'm, I'm fine with that. Like I can live with it. If it's at that price point, I'm not really like that, that, that is pretty big. And that's pretty substantial money, right? Like we're talking, $180 $180 million over seven years. Like, we're getting close to the money that they were offering in terms of AAV for Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Um, and, and I don't mean to be, you know, dismissive of Jordan Montgomery. I think he's a really good pitcher, but I don't think he's an Aaron Nola, or, or he's better than Aaron Nola, at least, you know, in, in my eyes. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, perhaps I'm wrong next year. Um, but I, I perceive Aaron Nola's value as higher than Jordan Montgomery, so I wouldn't m- match that dollar. Then for Blake Snell, like, yeah, the report's coming out that he could be a short-term guy. And I would be cool with that. I would love like high AV, low low years, do something like that. But at the same time, some people have pointed out to me, you know, what is the what are the chances that that's the best offer you can get in 2024? Uh, and what are the chances that another team goes out and offers him a little more financial security? You know, is he more interested in getting financial security, or is he more interested in going out and getting? Um, you know, the most money he can in the first two or three years of a deal and trying to opt out after. I don't know, right? We've seen Scott Boris, uh, I don't know, make a, uh, a very creative contract with a guy like Carlos Correa when he did that with the Twins, hit free agency the year after. But the issue is that Correa was 27. Snell is going to be 32 uh, at, at the end of his next, uh, at the end of next season. So a, a very different situation. As you mentioned with Shane Bieber, right? Like you just get one year of him, right? And at just one year of Shane Bieber, you kind of get an opportunity to figure out what he is. Um, if he's bad, you can kind of get rid of him. If he's good, great. You know, um, he's young, he's open to an extension too. So if he pitches really well, you could potentially look at him as a guy you keep long-term. Um, but the thing I have a big issue here with, or the, the over, not issue, but the overarching question here is like, are the Yankees going to get a chance to trade for these pitchers, right? Is Cleveland going to hold on to Bieber? They, they've considered, you know, they've considered maybe holding on to him. Um, I know that some people have reported that, like, they're looking to contend for the division. So so maybe there's not as much of an incentive to trade him. Um, and, and maybe the Yankees don't match up very well, right? Like, I was speaking to a couple of guys um, that, you know, are pretty tapped in with the Cleveland Guardians organization and, and with, the, with their system. And, you know, we were discussing kind of potential trade offers and all that stuff. And, you know, Everson Pereira doesn't necessarily stand out as as much of a good fit as we may think. I don't think his value across the league is as high as what it was maybe at the midway point of last year. Um, and perhaps teams anticipated that he would show a little bit of more of a skill progression at the major league level than he did. Um, I think the Yankees are fine if they hold on to him. I think that they have an opportunity to play him in AAA. He still has a couple more options. And, you know, the team can end up going out and, uh, you know, and, and I guess developing his hit to a little bit more. He's still young. Like, he he, he turned 22 last year. Um, you know, maybe he... he puts up a little bit of a better year at the major league level this year, who knows, um, but there are quite, like, another team, I guess my, well, my point here is another team has to take the offer the Yankees are making, right, and that's the tricky situation with trades, right, we don't really know what teams value, we've seen this time and time again where it's like, you know, 
even with the Juan Soto deal, we were like, hey, we'll give them Everson Pereira, Chase Hampton, and that'll be the headliners. And not only did they not want Chase Hampton as much as they wanted Drew Thorpe, they seem to want nothing to do with Everson Pereira. So our perceived uh, perception of value seems to differ a lot from teams. Um, you know, maybe they think Will Warren's really good and they want Will Warren and they're not willing to move, move off that price point. Are the Yankees making that deal or not? Who knows, right? Um, so there are just a lot of questions about the trade market. There are a lot of questions about the free agent market. And there's just not a lot of certainty here. We don't really know what the Yankees are going to do. We don't really know what, what's available to the Yankees. We don't know what the price points are. I think the fact that nobody's really moved at the top of the market outside of Yamamoto indicates that there's not a lot going on in terms of like the buyers are not willing to meet the, the buyers are not willing to meet the prices to get these players right now. And I think they know they can wait it out and say, all right, the closer we get to spring training, the more likely it is that some of these guys start flying off the board. Um, and, you know, ultimately, you just don't want to put yourself in a position where you add another bad pitching contract because, like, even if Rodon pitches well next year, the injuries will always make him a net negative. I think the Yankees knew that they were taking a risk on the contract, and that's and they were willing to sign him and, and go through with it. I think they liked their pitching depth, and they thought they could survive, you know, not having Rodon for a month or two here and there. Um, you know, they, I think they expected more from Nestor Cortez. I think they hoped that guys like Herman wouldn't fizzle out. Um, obviously Montas having that shoulder surgery, all that stuff affected them. They can't really afford to have another dud of a contract. Like Alex, if they sign Montgomery to a six year, $180 million deal and he stinks, what are they going to do? Right? Like, I don't, I don't know what you do at that point. You're kind of screwed. So, you know, they're, they're, they're I think they're going to be not passive, but I think they're going to be very selective with the money they hand out. So I would agree. I think the trade market might become a better option. And I want to float this out now. I think Oswald Peraza could be moved to a team for pitching. I know that he has another uh, minor league option now. And I know that that might give the Yankees the opportunity not to trade him. But I'm looking at a team like Miami and saying, hey, Peraza for Edward Cabrera, I could see that. Um, it seemed like the Giants saying, hey, they have some a surplus of AAA pitching depth. Try to go out and get that. Um, and then ultimately, you know, you could maybe add another starter for agency. I just, like, Alex, this market's weird, man, and, and the Yankees are going to have to do a hell of a job to navigate through it because there's not a lot of other teams that are making noise in the pitching market for a reason. Yeah, exactly, and, you know, you look really at what, you know, Joel Sherman reported last night. Montgomery's aiming for over $172 million, so more than Aaron Nola, and then Snell's over $200 million. I I can't express how little I want to sign Snell or Montgomery for over that amount. You know what I mean? Like, I can't. I can't possibly vocalize how stupid that would be for the Yankees to do. You save that money. You save that money. You go into 2025, and you allocate that money to a Wheeler, or you allocate that money to a Burns, and you get a guy who eats freaking innings, postseason experience, and that dominates. You know, if you're going to spend, they were just ready to spend 300 mil on Yamamoto, who's never pitched an MLB inning. You can't argue right now that they shouldn't give 300 mil to a player like Burns, who is freaking elite, or Wheeler on a shorter-term deal for less than 300 mil that has postseason dominance under his belt. You know what I mean? Like, they're, the Yankees have options next year. That's why I don't think they're spending right now, Ryan. I think that they're not going to spend on either uh, Snell or Montgomery now. That's kind of the that's kind of where I'm leading to, and that's why I think Bieber's a really good alternative. You take that gamble uh, because I, I unfortunately just don't see a world where this doesn't – you know, I think Montgomery, he's going to regress. And I think Snell, he's going to end up becoming a bullpen arm in three years. Like, I'm really concerned about those two guys in terms of overpaying them now. You wait a year. If all it's going to take is one year to extend, you know, Soto, and then you're going to grab one of those top pitchers, and you got money coming off the books in the future. So you're basically just replacing those other bad contracts with hopefully good contracts. You know, eventually Stanton will be off the books. Eventually DJ LeMahieu is going to be off the books. You know, you're going to have young prospects elevating. Spencer Jones will take over an outfield spot. So you'll, you know, Verdugo's contract won't be there anymore. Um, obviously, you know, you have younger guys. Volpe's still pre arbitration. Um, you're going to have to play, pay Glaber Torres. That's going to be an interesting one that we'll have to figure out next year. Rizzo will be off the books. So that's 20 million. We need Ben Rice to step the hell up. That again, guy that we really want to keep an eye on this upcoming season. Ben Rice, he could be our future first baseman. We need him to continue his hitting development and continue getting reps at first base. Rizzo, that's 20 mil. I mean, think about it, Ryan. Like $20 million and then another five mil from Verdugo. Jason Dominguez takes over in one of those corner spots or takes over in center field. Um, DJ the Mayhew's contract takes over in 2026. So like you're two years away from that. Uh, next offseason, that is. So, you know, you have $25 million coming off the books next year. That pays for most of Burns. You know what I mean? That pays for most of Burns on a long-term deal. And the Yankees can eat that. They can spend a little bit of money. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility here. So I really think that next year we wait. We get that money. We allocate. We 
you know, promote some youngsters into into prominent roles, and you you go with you go with that strategy. You have a nice blend of youth and proven talent. Now, again, Burns will be thirty years old, but the dude has proven his durability, proven his dominance. Or you go Wheeler, who's going to be thirty four on a shorter term deal, which also is not a bad option at all. But right now, overspending on Monty Arsenal just to do it, just to try and compete. I feel like it would be a long-term net negative, and instead of maybe it would be a short-term positive, but I think long-term it'll hurt us. Um, and I don't think Cashman can afford another bad contract to hurt him in three years. I just don't think that he can survive that. Um, so we'll see what happens, guys. Always happy to hear your perspectives below in the YouTube comment sections. Make sure to like and subscribe as always, and we'll catch you guys on the next Fireside Yankees episode.